So, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I don't think I've had one that was quite that elaborate, but uh, I want you guys to get to know me. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, this is actually my first time presenting in person in over a year, which is kind of crazy because I'm so used to presenting in person, so I like seeing all of your faces. And one of the things I will say before I get started, so I just graduated from the psychiatry program here a couple months ago, so I'm not that far ahead of you guys. Um, but this room in particular brings back good memories for me because it was where I first did my orientation here four years ago. It's where I got vaccinated and then vaccinated again. Um, so Rowan holds a, a deep place in my heart. So I'm very grateful to be back here. And if you guys ever need anything, you can reach out to me at the end of the presentation. Um, so one of the things that I am passionate about is GLBTQ work, as she said, particularly um, diversity, talking about how to make healthcare more accessible. So today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, mental health disparities in these communities, specifically during the pandemic. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit, a mix between research slash what I'm actually clinically seeing myself. Ooh, how do I get this to go? All right, so uh, this is gonna be a little bit of a repeat, but I was asked to give a little bit of uh, information about myself. Does anybody know the woman in the picture with me? Anybody know that woman? It's, her name is Dr. Jennifer Ashton. She's the medical correspondent for ABC News. She's done a lot of television shows. She's been on The Doctors. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey first. So n number one, I've always been passionate about these issues because I am transgender myself. So I first got started, I've only been really talking publicly actually for about three years. Um, I first got started because the chair of my department, Dr. Scheinfeld, recommended I do a diversity uh, panel at a conference and I realized that, wow, I absolutely love it because you got to meet new people, you get to see new things, new environments. So then I started doing more conferences after that. And one of the things about being in person is that if people like you, they'll come up to you and offer you more opportunities. So then that's how I got started really doing um, publications because mainly the, the connections I made at conferences. So then from there, I started doing publications, more research, so that's where that started. These two pictures that you're seeing are from my ABC News rotation. One of them is me actually talking on the news for World Mental Health Day. And then the other one was where I was working with Dr. Jennifer Ashton. Any person can apply for this as a resident. So um, I got to know about this through Dr. Jennifer Cottle, who does a lot of television work as well. Following my rotation with ABC News, which I thought really highlighted my my story, uh, my application, my resume, that's when I more so decided to start applying for these scholarships, particularly with the work with GLBTQ uh, individuals, because that's what I focused on. Particularly, I wrote a lot of articles for ABC News, which is one of my greatest accomplishments to date. Um, but that's when I started applying for more of these scholarships after I had done a bit of work, and then that's where I was honored by some of these amazing um, institutions. Um, and so I'm gonna continue to do that. I encourage you all to do that. So that is a little bit about me, where I got started. I've always been passionate about these issues. All right, so when we're talking about mental health disparities, I'm first gonna start off with some things in particular that I am seeing. This is obviously a very short list, and I actually, there are two bullet points that I'll talk about a little bit more. So for the part of the pandemic, I was working at our outpatient psychiatry clinic here at Rowan that I'll talk about for a year. So what was I really seeing the risk factors that was really getting people coming to our clinic? So one was feeling alone, feeling isolated, particularly the quarantine period um, and not feeling like they connect with, with their current social contacts. Another big one was unable to pay their bills. So unemployment being I had some patients that were essentially obsessed with paying their bills, trying to get another job, and then they absolutely couldn't because of the pandemic. And then some people that were motivated, unfortunately, to work, that's what uh, they got used to. Another challenge that I particularly saw was difficulty with adjusting to a new environment. So particularly here, what I was seeing usually was with the female patients and they had kids, kiddos in school, and they had to learn how to work with them uh, virtually. 
so those were some of the big reasons initially why people's stress was increasing that was leading to more mental health problems. Um, another common thing that I was seeing was elderly. Elderly, elderly, elderly. <laughs> um, really concerned overall about their uh, health status as well as their partner's health status was another presenting problem. And then another big one I will say is a little bit biased because I work for a clinic that specifically specialized in this, which was intellectual disabilities. But what I will say is that ever since the pandemic started, these people really like consistency in their environment and their actions. If there's any small change, they usually result in behavioral problems. Um, so that was something particularly difficult that there were much more behavioral problems than normal. Most of these people were stable, and then I was inheriting them where they were having issues coping, particularly with the, the mask wearing and the social distancing and being at home in their group homes as opposed to out in public. Um, one other thing that I will say that I did notice is that when I was working, I couldn't believe how quickly our clinic, I was completely booked in like eight weeks of starting. And that was something that I really didn't realize was going to be a challenge before I started at the clinic. And I'm already starting to notice it becoming a problem with school as well. So that was something that I think I even had a hard time getting adjusted to. So this list, um, some people in the audience might be saying, there's so many more other things. This is just particularly what I'm seeing. The populations that I saw primarily present to me was more along women in particular and elderly. So I actually did not see a lot of the ethnic minorities and that was just because of the census that I inherited as well as I think the population type that our clinic mostly what what I kind of inherited. So that's what I'm seeing in specific. So let's talk about the this in a little bit more detail. So feeling alone. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about more more research. So I think that we all know this, that unexpected death of a loved one is a risk factor for mental health problems. I think that this was before the pandemic, even more so now. But one of the things that I want to point your attention to is that it has been shown that there is an increased risk in the number of unexpected deaths that a person had in terms of psychiatric comorbidities. So I think that this is hopefully, I, I think that the way I look at this is that you have a stressful event and the more stress that you have, not ability to cope is likely going to lead over time to psychiatric problems. So in this case, particularly with the pandemic, one of the biggest things is overall deaths. So I think that this bullet point is important because unfortunately, I'm sure you've heard over the news that there are people who have lost like several family members at once or within a couple of weeks. So you combine all those individual stressful events together given the time period, that is something I personally have not seen, but I think is very common in the pandemic. Looking at the second bullet point, looking specifically at people breathing individuals, the prevalence of prolonged breathing is typically more seen in twice as long among African American individuals in comparison to non-Hispanic whites. So overall, what this is saying is that overall, different ethnic minorities might even have a harder time with the death coping period. Now in psychiatry, one of the things that I don't agree with uh, <laughs> is that we've seen this before, you typically consider the normal bereavement time a year. And it only really becomes abnormal if you start turning the bereavement onto yourself. Like, oh, I wish that I was dead, or I wish, as opposed to being more focused on the individual, it's very common to see um, people hearing things about their, their lost loved one. I actually don't necessarily agree. I think the length of time is completely different depending upon the circumstance. So I actually don't like putting a, a time frame. But what this bullet point is mainly saying is that people are going to have a harder time with it and that uh, non-white individuals might be at higher risk for problems if there is a death. All right, so what is the main message, message here? Is that disparities in COVID-19 mortality rates could contribute to elevated grief and psychiatric morbidity. I think that this is overall a message that we know, but I think the important thing about the, the pandemic is that I think it switched a little bit from being more of descriptive and research to now being more statistical and numbers, which I think changes the overall perception of the message and how we deal with it. So 
looking at that here is now this is specifically ethnic minorities you can see this is this is a little bit outdated but i picked this picture primarily because it occurred during one of the key parts of the pandemic one of the biggest surges but you can see during this time period a couple of things you can see that the overall trajectory of the proportion of people who are dying per 100,000 is in general staying roughly the same. Like for this period of time, indigenous was higher, it continued to grow at a relatively proportional rate. Same thing for the other uh, categories here. So one of the things to note once again is that what this picture overall is saying, and this is just a snapshot, of course, of the pandemic. And anything that I talk about today is a snapshot. At one point in the pandemic, kids are more affected, then they're less affected, elderly versus younger. So this is a snapshot, but it overall calls into question the uh, same, same thing, is that maybe people of uh, ethnic minorities might have an increased risk, particularly with this category of death, which might correspond later on to psychiatric um, problems. But one of the things to really ask yourself is why are indigenous black people, why are we having more rates of death that could translate into mental health problems versus let's say white people or in this, in this chart, Asian people? And I think the important thing is that these answers, these questions, we already know. But I think the difference is, again, now we're really seeing it in numbers, which raises awareness in a different way than what we're used to. And it's being projected all over the television. So it really calls into question um, these factors, which is the problems with poor access to care, stigma, um, financial instability, which are probably three of the biggest ones overall. All right, so this information is literally exactly the same as this graph. It is just really in uh, written form or written text. And overall, the message is overall the same. But one of the key things is that even though, let's say, white individuals have a lower risk of death, that doesn't equal, necessarily translate into they're going to have less psychiatric problems than, let's say, black individuals. All these groups are at risk because obviously COVID affects everybody. But the point is that you might be seeing more, you know, African American people present than normal. This was not the case for me. I specifically did not see an increase, but this is something that people, especially psychiatrists, should really look out for. Um, all right, so kind of adding on this. So this is something that was depicted really in the news that I think that is known. So racial ethnic disparities in COVID-19 mortality attribute to the fact that they have risk factors that affect death. So what this is really referring to is it has been documented that these individuals have more issues with chronic conditions like hypertension, cardiac illness. And we already know the reason is because they're tending to present to their healthcare settings a little bit later. A big reason is stigma and perception of stigma, which is really contributing to this. Going along with this, even before COVID-19, these populations were already vulnerable because of their lower socioeconomic status, which has now gotten worse because of uh, the pandemic. And as I said before, other factors might contribute as well, including unfi unstable financial status, which therefore will affect their ability to seek out health care resources. All right, so let's talk about another, another pretty big uh, problem here, which is stress resulting from COVID-19 uh, related financial insecurity. I think we all know, I'm trying to beat the picture that stress any stressor, it can be a death, it can be illness, sickness. In the end, all equal stress, which is the biggest thing that I see in, in well, saw with the outpatient clinic was that people had so much stress, they couldn't cope and therefore their coping turned into behavioral problems, depression, and sometimes drugs, unfortunately. Um, but it has been documented that there is a correlation between financial insecurity and psychiatric problems. The important, I think, part of the first bullet point is really looking at the fact that a lot of the problems that we're talking about today is actually a double tiered problem. Rather than, so you think about financial insecurity, that's what it is, financial insecurity is the problem. But in reality is really in, you have to break it down into actual financial insecurity, so actual problems, as well as perceived problems. So maybe somebody has a job, but as I include here, fear 
of losing their job, which is something that I very heavily saw. Even though people had jobs, they still had problems with this because of this. So when you guys think about things and stress that could relate to patients presenting, well, at least for me, with psychi psychiatric problems, you really have to think about how do you deal with the actual problem as well as their perception, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, all right, moving down to the second bullet point. I think that this is another point that is um, known that socially disadvantaged groups, there's a disproportional rate of them being affected more so in terms of problems with jobs than, than, other, than some of their other counterparts. For example, look at the unemployment rate was 3.6 to 14.7, but then with the pandemic, here's what it rose to. Look at the, look at the numbers for black individuals, 11.5 to 31.2, which I, I, is something new for me, is very, very high. And then look at, look at for Latinos, up to 16.7%. So because they're affected disproportionately higher, they're probably not gonna seek out mental health services. And even if they do, they're gonna probably have a much, much harder time doing that. Looking at the third bullet point, another survey, essentially, you know, something very, very similar. The main point is that these groups are affected at a, a disproportional rate to to some of our other counterparts, 57% of Hispanics reported lost jobs, reduced work hours during the pandemic, compared to a lower number of African American individuals and non-Hispanic whites. Now, I do think that with this, some of this research, you have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt because this is particularly evident during certain parts of the pandemic, and at certain parts of the pandemic you're gonna find research or information saying that more people are affected here, less people are affected here. Now this population is affected. So they're all really snapshots, but I'm trying to give you an overall general view of what the research is saying, but also what I think is happening. All right, so we're talking about this continued, still focusing on African-American individuals. A third of hospitalized COVID-19 patients, with this has been pretty consistent, are African-American. But it's interesting because if you look at the whole trajectory of the general population in the United States, only like 12%, 13% of the population are African American. So you wouldn't expect to see that significantly high rate of proportionalized African American patients hospitalized. So it is disproportionately affecting them um, in specific. If you look at the second bullet point supporting this point, outside of the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, African-American individuals were found to have a fourfold increased risk of COVID-19 infection. And the overall reason we've talked about before, which is a big reason is because of the problem with having more chronic conditions, worsening health profiles, even probably existing before the pandemic. Something that I think is really important to highlight here is a lot of them that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 showed problems, but only a minimum amount sought out psychiatric care. And so that begs the question of why. And I think one of the things, there was something good that did happen, which I'll talk about in a second, but I think that uh, there is a general mistrust, number one, problems with cultural insensitivity that we don't see that we live in a different community. So a general mistrust of health systems based on historical mistreatment of African-American people in psychiatric care. I would beg to say that this is actually the general mistreatment in general inside and outside of healthcare. So I think one example to kind of pull up here is the George Floyd case that you have to, I looked at it as, oh my gosh, you know, we might not know that this goes on and that there's a general uh, mistreatment of behaviors. And I think the George Floyd case really highlighted the fact that there are still problems that outside of the African communities, we might not even be aware of. We might feel like, yeah, it's getting better uh, or we're just not aware of it. So I think that the George Floyd case really highlighted awareness, education and knowledge that these things are still going on. So you can translate that. That was a scenario that didn't happen in healthcare but you can translate that into, okay, maybe this highlights the fact that there are still potential problems in healthcare that we're not seeing, or we thought were getting better, but we don't know from a perspective of a community that we, don't, that we didn't grow up in. 
Um, so I think that that's something really important. So that's one of the main reasons why I do media is because I think that media is the way to reach the most amount of people in the quickest period of time and to hopefully start to change overall perception. If every single issue, for example, in these communities was highlighted or at least the most important ones, it would raise awareness, education, but also signify to the communities that these individuals are important enough to highlight that maybe it could inspire change. So that's one of the main approaches that I personally take is trying to do things on a global or more national basis to try to inspire things, particular change, not just within the transgender community. Um, all right, so the last two bullet points are really talking about indigenous people. If you remember from the graph before, they were the individuals during that span period that have the highest rate of death. And some of the problems with them is overall, they're in their isolated communities, remote uh, areas that prevent them from seeking mental health care, but, but I think it can be said about health care in general, which is a major problem. And if you look at this bullet point, they tend to handle stress independently of others, relying on spirituality to guide them, leading to a decline in seeking out services. So that's likely contributing to that number that we saw um, in the graph earlier. All right, so now talking about Asian American individuals for a second. This is one I wanted to include real briefly. So when you look at the slide, you can see the bullet point. I think that with any, any community at one point or another, you're going to find, again, that certain individuals have a very high percentage of particularly depression, anxiety, and that's the case here. So looking at the snapshot, but rather focusing on the actual percentage, I think it's important to say what communities are most affected, why, and what do we do about it? Um, I like to put things kind of into simplistics. So this slide is essentially saying that yes, Asian American individuals are affected. But I think that for this population in particular, the reason is a little bit more carved out, particularly um, looking at the middle part. In the United States, many Asian Americans are targeted by their ethnicity in response to reports of the emerging virus. If you remember in the news, a lot of people were blamed for bringing over the virus from China just because it originated in China and that really targeted them particularly because people maybe assume they came from China or it originated within their ethnicity so it's their fault. Um, I do think that this issue is getting better now. Luckily I think because the issue is a little bit more targeted that you can that if you look at the later part of this bullet point, a higher level of community support mitigates the impact of discrimination on symptoms in these individuals. So I think that, I think again, in the United States now, this is getting a little bit better, but I think that this is the major reason why I wanted to overall include this slide in this presentation. All right, so now going on to Hispanic American individuals. And I could talk about this stuff for hours. Uh, you see there's a lot of information. So just a general snapshot. With this uh, population of note, again, not something that I necessarily see clinically, but something the research points to, is that specifically as opposed to really targeting um, certain symptoms, look at the a higher incidence of suicidal thoughts compared to other uh, groups in the United States. So one of the things that I have seen of the challenges with working with the Hispanic population particularly that I think is contributing to this number is there's a language barrier and a lot of Spanish speaking and that makes access to healthcare harder and even if people can get a translator it's a lot less personable and the, the language barrier creates a big challenge Another big challenge is that a lot of these individuals that's supported by research and what I see, they don't have health insurance. And the poverty is very, is very, very bad in this population. So you're left again with that financial stress, but particularly a language barrier is particularly, oop, sorry, <laughs> is particularly challenging for this population. So what do you do? So, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, but I think that it would be helpful to have specifically oriented clinics to deal with certain types of individuals depending upon their problems. So you have people 
who are, have more financial problems, a clinic that deals more with lower income individuals. You have staff that can already deal with populations that speak different languages. So catering to different uh, communities, I think would really help this. Um, the next bullet point is really saying that this group is overrepresented in critical essential workers, essentially saying that they had potential exposure uh, to COVID-19. I think that we can pretty much say that everybody had potential exposure in one way or another, but this particular paper found that based upon their work environment that this was a particular disproportional issue affecting Hispanic American individuals. All right, so this slide I wanted to include real, real briefly. I said this earlier, but this is not, I think, a group that is generally talked about in general, but I wanted to bring it to awareness primarily because this is something that I have seen um, myself working in a clinic that catered to these issues. So I didn't include a lot of research here. I did include one saying more emergency room admissions, particularly in Spain with autism spectrum disorder. But uh, this also hits a little bit home for me because I do have a sister who is mentally challenged. So the issues for these individuals is more so going to be behavioral changes. So not necessarily the classic mental health symptoms that you're going to see that are going to affect a lot of the other groups like depression, anxiety. These groups, it's, it's going to be much more behavioral. Um, and you're immediately tell, and the big thing that I dealt with with this was really was overall medication management, but also getting these individuals in a consistent and structured routine with the lockdown the way that it was. And then when things got better to kind of slowly graduate out of that routine, taking baby steps and then reintroduce them back into their regular routine that they had. And it tended to work really well. But I think that with this particular, and uh, this is, you're gonna see this if you're a psychiatrist or a regular doctor, you're going to see behavioral challenges with these individuals. Um, but I think the most important thing here on what to do uh, in terms of, at least with my job, is overall consistency and behavioral management, even more so than, than uh, medications. All right, so my favorite topic. Uh, well, actually, I'm biased, but um, let's talk about gender minorities for a couple of minutes. So this is the population specifically where I come from. Um, it's the population I feel most comfortable talking about. So. Gender minorities, the GLBTQ population has a couple of unique challenges. Um, but one of the things that I'll say is in the, in the pandemic, you think about these stay at home orders. And it's a challenge because if you stay at home, it protects you from the virus. But I don't think it was talked about a lot, challenges of staying at home. And here is highlighting one of them, which is within the gender minority spectrum, which is they face, as I'm sure you know, a lot of discrimination, violence, in my experience in dealing particularly with transgender people, so talking about the T for a minute, the problems more originate in the family and lack of acceptance rather than society. In society, you might have certain groups that want nothing to do with you, but you have so many options and colorful people that you'll probably find a group that will support you. You have one family, a certain amount of people. So what I usually find with the transgender people is that there's a lot of issues, particularly with the coming out phase and acceptance, particularly in, within the family. So what happens if you're dealing with, a, with any one of these individuals in the uh, population when they're told to stay at home, when they don't get along with their family because they're not accepted, which can be an additional stressor placed on the GLBTQ population that no, wasn't necessarily before. Maybe they had an abusive family, but they could get away. Now they can't which also calls ties to a different thing. You're taking away something that they're used to, which I feel like in this community, and I have seen this as a person and as a doctor, they very heavily rely on uh, social support, support groups, going to certain events that are specifically catered to GLBTQ individuals. They stopped happening. So you took away their only support and potentially added it back to people that don't support them, which has, I think, I can't say because I haven't dealt with a lot specifically with the, in the pandemic, but I could see that being an issue. Um, because of the issues that I talked about, there is a study that found that there is a much more highly chance of a traumatic event happening that could meet future for a criteria for COVID-related PTSD problems. 
So something else that I think is important to highlight about the GLBTQ population is that there are specific differences in the way that you treat the GLBTQ population versus other people. There are very high rates of STDs, for example, um, you have a lot of HIV, um, particularly it's disproportionately high in this population. Also for transgender people, you have hormone replacement therapy, which is not something that you give to obviously everybody in the community. You have a lot of transitional goals and surgery. So the challenge here is that they have a lot of additional health needs that are not present in other groups. And those things because of COVID and this high demand to deal with COVID, the emergent problem, these things kind of got shuffled a little bit to the side. And a lot of transgender people have probably reported that they had to put their transitional goals on hold. But there is research specifically saying that they have had difficulty obtaining HIV medications and mental health care in 59 countries. So for me personally, in my own experience, this is 100% true. I had to start unfortunately turning away patients in about like 10 weeks because it got so badly full. And then after a couple of months, every single like therapy referral place that we referred them to, they were all completely booked. And so I can easily see how this could happen because of the spur of the demand for mental health care. Now, this next bullet point is one that I think that we already know, again, high rates of depression, anxiety, but looking at the last part, globally it has been reported that gender minorities would delay or avoid seeking care for COVID-19 symptoms due to anticipated stigma and discrimination. So this is something that is not new, was existing before the pandemic. Now this just kind of unfortunately adds a little bit of an additional layer to it. And the problem is that their needs are not necessarily being taken care of particularly gender minorities make up a very small part of the overall research that's out there. So in some cases, we don't even necessarily know exactly what they need to, to reduce this stigma and discrimination. So you're hearing me talk in all these different groups, particularly in the African-American groups and now in this group. So a common theme is anticipated stigma and discrimination. So once again, a double-folded problem. It's not just discrimination. It is actual discrimination things that are actually going on versus perceived discrimination which is guided by people's past experiences uh, trauma memories either or it doesn't matter whether one's present or both are present it's going to lead to the same overall response which is probably which is exactly highlighted here which is delaying or avoid seeking care COVID-19 symptoms, it could be mental health care, general care in general, but when you think about the problem, you have to think about it from a double-pronged approach. So the actual discrimination, I think, is a little bit easier to deal with because other people can pick up on it, other people can see it and support them. The perception is what's challenging because you can't, you can't necessarily get the way someone's perceiving something unless they tell you. And if you don't have access to the person and they might just not want to tell you in general. So how do you change the overall perception of discrimination? Again, I go back to the fact of trying to change labels, trying to change what it means to be part of a certain community, educating the public. So that's like, once again, why I do a lot of media work. And I honestly think that that is the reason why things have gotten a little bit better over time because there's been more coverage, more understanding, more time put forward into trying to understand these issues. All right, so pregnant women. I wanted to talk a little bit about women for a minute um, because pregnant women you might not necessarily think about, but a lot of times women have might be the primary provider for their kids, might have more access to their kids, might be caring for more of their elderly parents. And so that can all contribute to problems. But particularly, and I've had this with a patient of mine, there, there was a lot of concern. So to me, it's not surprising that there's research overall showing that there have been issues with pregnant women, women in general as well. So one of the things that I'll call here is there were more problems reported in pregnancy because of risk of vertical transmission of the virus. Um, the last part of the bullet point is saying that female gender is a risk factor as well for some psychiatric problems. 
But I think the, uh, the main thing I want to call to here is this is another group that you have to think about where the stay at home orders might have negatively affected a population in a specific way. So this is another challenge with someone's in a domestic violence case. Normally, you're not going to have a woman who's going to walk out there and tell you, but at least she'll be able to get out in the world and get away from the purse from her abuser. But this is a challenge in the pandemic that now they don't have that outlet anymore, so they're stuck at home more and dealing more with the abuser, which has led to, if you look here, an increase in domestic violence rates against women worldwide during the pandemic. Now, this is something that could be a problem. Now, I know that this slide specifically says pregnant women, but obviously this is a problem for pregnant women and women. It's, it's uh, a global problem. So then it calls into question, which is, what do you do about it? And I'll, I'll talk about that in another slide or two. All right, so elderly. This is a big, this is another big one that I personally saw um, during my training here uh, at Rowan. So I think that all these issues, the first couple of bullet points here, uh, were pretty heavily depicted in the media. But I think that one, one specific challenge that I will highlight with this community was uh, technology issues. So there are risk factors, as you can see in the last bullet point, that if they have more contacts, if they have higher education, if they're cognitively intact, it's gonna to lead to a better adaptation. If they're not, it's gonna to lead to a slower adaptation. But I feel like it's safe to say that with the elderly population, they're going to have a harder time with technology in general because it's not something that they're used to. This is something that I really saw was a humongo problem, uh, <laughs> was a pretty big problem. Um, a lot of people, elderly individuals, I couldn't get them on the virtual platform. So um, that's a specific problem that I noticed myself that I'll talk about in a minute what, what we can kind of do about it. All right, so some of this stuff I've talked about a little bit. So what do we do about all this? On this slide, I really highlighted some of the key issues that I felt were being depicted in this presentation. I've talked about perceived versus actual discrimination. So for me personally, I have talked about media coverage of these issues. It can be an article. Overall, trying to have people read something tangible to educate them about the problem or at least call awareness to its significance. And over time, I think that that will change the overall perception. And that's why things I think now are better than where they were before. Um, all right, what happens if you're dealing with someone with physical access to healthcare settings? So I put down here virtual platform. I do believe that the virtual learning um, or see with seeing patients will continue, particularly for psychiatry, because I don't have to, you know, see, well, I don't have to touch them, so I think that that will particularly happen. But you have to educate people on step-by-step -step instructions on how to access that virtual platform ahead of time. Um, so having your staff call the patients uh, with verbal and written instructions before your uh, appointment will be important. I'm assuming they're starting to go to class. Okay, you guys can trickle out if you have to, sorry. We started a little bit late, so. Um, all right, so I also said outreach. That they're, if they're not willing to come to you, sometimes you have to make efforts to go to them, which I think are particularly important. There's a psychiatric service here at Rowan that, well, actually it's at Oaks Integrated Care, which is affiliated with Rowan, called the PAC team, where they actually have doctors, psychiatrists, nurses go to the patients sometimes you're not gonna get a patient to go to you. So with organizations that deal with diversity, um, different disparities, you're going to, if you are passionate about certain, you can say, hey, maybe we can do an outreach program here. That's exactly how I, how I got, came to Rowan was actually through an outreach program, but it's obviously for a different reason. So I wanna talk about this, many health clinics overbooked, which happened to me pretty much instantly. So what do we do about this? I talk about psychoeducation. So, what do you do with people who they need mental health services you're completely booked your colleagues are completely booked the therapists are all completely booked i think that it's worthwhile to have for me i can direct people to specific articles that are written on psychoeducation but i found that it's really helpful to have um, on your website directing the specific online resources that give specific techniques such as deep breathing tension reduction um, you can also have pamphlets 
in your clinic that you can hand out to patients or email them just general stuff that they can start to work on while you put them on a wait list. And that's something that I have personally found to be very, very helpful. If you can't get them in, put them on a wait list. In the meantime, they can start working on educating themselves by reading through some online resources or pamphlet resources that you have. But this is something that clinics will have to take time to create and be willing to give them out to patients that they haven't necessarily committed to yet. But I think that that's something that would be helpful. So self-isolation, feeling alone. This is a big one. I think a lot of people have probably felt this somewhere throughout the pandemic. So what I feel would be helpful both, as a per, both personally and as a doctor is that people respond to stress differently. And if you can work on stress reduction techniques, that's overall gonna make them obviously feel better. I find with being a psychiatrist, one of the, specifically with the adult population, is that the biggest, one of the biggest risk factors to developing mental health problems with stress is feeling alone, not having enough social support. So what I'm gonna to say to you is some people might not show on their face that they're struggling. Some people might not open up to you, but you never know when you give someone just a very minor thing, taking a couple minutes out of your day doing something for someone else, it might really turn them around or they might open up to you. So how do you connect? You have to connect with peers, and I tell this with patients all the time, that connect with others. It doesn't have to be through telephone calls, virtual groups, particularly Facebook, because that's one of the most popular. So let's say that someone is depressed and they're not willing to do these things. It can be offered, hey, maybe let's go to the group together virtually a couple of times, or hey, I'll come over, we can watch it together, or hey, I'll set you up, I know what to do. So I think that that will improve. Now, I don't know how, for medical students, I think it must be very hard going through medical school, plus the daily challenges of life, plus COVID. So I think that this is a bullet point that's much easier said than done that you should really pay attention to in addition to your family members. Now, the other one that I talked about was financial insecurity due to the pandemic, which is a big problem. What I'm gonna say here, again, I talked about this a little bit earlier, is that there should be an overall direction of patients to clinics that specialize in, per, in particular issues that they're focused on. For example, there are popping up a lot of GLBTQ and transgender related health clinics because of their specific needs. So a lot of this requires a lot of research from a clinician standpoint or their staff standpoint, which is, or it can, can be from a medical student standpoint if you wanna have community contact. Do research in your community and see what clinics cater to certain populations. For example, with uh, financial insecurity, I work for a clinic called Oaks Integrated Care, which is a psychiatric uh, clinic that more so caters to people of lower income households. So there were definitely some ethnic minorities there, but the organization was important because it didn't just help give people access to groups and mental health care services, but they also had a social worker that potentially helped them get uh, figure out their living situation because a lot of them were homeless. So doing research into your community, I'll give you another example. The Mazzoni Center is a center in uh, Philadelphia, so pretty close to here, that caters specifically to GLBTQ individuals, particularly T, and provide services for their transitional goals. They hold a conference every single year. It's really good. So if you do research as a doctor or have your clinic do research, these are things that would be helpful to have on your website or educate to patients. Let's say you can't treat them and they say, you can direct them at least into a specific place. And that is what you guys can do if you have a particular interest in a particular area in medicine, not just what we're talking about today, but I think the key part of this is really community research and a lot of it. All right, so I wanted to, I had some questions from you guys um, that I got before the presentation that I wanted to address briefly. I know it's one o'clock and you guys have to go to class soon, but um, one individual asked, how do you think your desire to work with queer patients influence your overall opportunities in your career so far? So I actually think my answer is a little bit opposite that even before I started working with these communities, I was already starting to do conferences and make myself known. 
I think people were really impressed with me based upon my willingness to talk about my personal stuff, but also educational and knowledge stuff. So as I started to do more, that's when patients started to actually figure out who I was and then come to me. So I think that overall my opportunities more so shaped the population type that I treat rather than the other way around of me working with this specific population that led, led to opportunities because I already had that desire to work with them before it happened. Um, did you face pushback from peers, higher physicians when they found out about your goals to help the GLBTQ? No. Um, I, I think that people were excited that it was something different, that it was not something that was typically talked about. ABC pretty much let me talk about any, every, anything and everything I wanted, except when COVID hit, then they really wanted more stuff with COVID. But in general, I really haven't had pushback. Now, when I was a medical student, I did have issues, um, but that was several years ago. So uh, I'm kind of aging myself. But uh, in specific, in residency, I really haven't had any, any problems. Uh, how could we as medical students work to improve mental health within our, and as well as our community? So this is something that I, that I talked about on the previous slide I wanted to re-highlight again, is that I think it's fair to see that every single person has problems at one point or another, the problems were probably augmented because of the pandemic. At one point or another, everyone has probably felt alone. So increasing that contact among your peers, luckily now you guys are um, more together, you're in person, which is a lot better. I didn't see my colleagues in our program for like a year. I felt like I was starting to forget what they looked like. <laughs> Um, but, but we didn't see them for a really long time and that kind of damaged the relationship for a period of time and everybody gets so busy, including you guys, I'm sure you're all very busy, but make sure that you ask people very minor things. You might not know them. I was even going to have an activity saying like, turn to a, talk to a stranger and tell some things about yourself, but I decided not to, um, within, within the community. So outreach program. So if you don't know, you can start with the diversity committee that are going to know really the programs around the community really, really well. You could ask me. I just gave you uh, two examples today that you can do more research on that you can specifically educate your peers on. You can decide to coordinate an event and go to those communities and provide education. I think doing anything at this point would be helpful to any of the communities. So, but you have to have, for all these things that we're talking about, you have to have initiative. Uh, you have to initiate it and you have to have motivation. If you don't have that, you know, it's, none of these measures are going to work. Um, all right, what can we do to provide support for our own peers mental health group? A big way I said once again is joining support groups, particularly virtual, because you can go when you want to go. You can make it coordinate with your medical school student schedule. People can offer to go to groups with you. All right. So next question. Now that you've gone through treating patients during the pandemic, what things can be approved upon the chance? I love this question. I don't know who asked who asked this question, but I really like this question. Uh, a chance another pandemic happens in the future. So one of the things that I will say, as you can see by my answer, is I do believe that the virtual medicine platform will likely stay, which is something that is good that has come from the pandemic because it overall taught us the ability to adapt and how to accommodate ourselves to our changing environment. So especially in psychiatry, this is going to stay. Um, but I think a big important thing if another uh, pandemic happens is for every single health clinic, having a potential backup plan of a virtual option. And this might be necessary either way, because what happens if you have disabled patients who can't make it to your office? What do you do with them? So this should probably be in place regardless and probably should have been happened before the pandemic, but have education to all professionals medical professionals and patients with a virtual platforms, give them verbal and written instructions step by step. So this should probably be part of their initial patient information and packet. Give them overall updates if they need it. Email them with more information, but give them updates needed to operate it. So that way if something else did happen in the future, hopefully people know exactly what to do. And if they don't know what to do, people can easily um, send out written instructions on how to do it. You can also have somebody, you can instruct them to have somebody help you with it. So mental health clinics severely overbooked, patients left without service. So something that could help this 
is having as needed staff. This happens, I saw this in the hospital all the time where there are as needed staff members for the extra support that were needed on our units. That's something that uh, clinics can consider doing. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, but if another pandemic happens, it, it becomes, what do you do? Do you treat the most amount of patients or do you treat less patients but give them the best care possible? These are, it's a challenging situation in emergency times. But you could consider having slightly shorter appointment times to try to have more people. You can consider if people are more stable in psychiatry, you typically see them every two or three months. You could consider seeing them four months if they're more stable. Another thing that can, that can happen, this is not a good solution, but sometimes desperate times come for desperate measures. If there are not nearly enough psychiatrists to have the demand, you can temporarily um, have, I mean, family medicine doctors are doing it regardless of the pandemic or not because of the demand. You can provide specialized lectures specifically dictated to family medicine individuals. I've given family medicine individuals uh, lectures. Uh, with more specialized training so they feel more comfortable just to treat them in the really emergent times in the pandemic and then after well, if another pandemic happens and then once that pandemic gets to a little bit more controlled then you take over the patients so that's something that can happen again as i said that you can have clinics and have basic education packets to give to their patients and patients just basic resources or have on their website online resources in terms of the overall discrimination Look at Rowan. Rowan diversity is a big thing, like what we're doing right now. So it's not surprising that Rowan has a really high ratio of minorities coming into their class. It's all with the way that it's advertised and marketed. So that's something else that all institutions as well as um, medical institutions and clinics can consider doing and will likely have a similar outcome as this institution has given as an example. Um, all right, so the last question that I specifically got um, before the presentation was making telemedicine more accessible for geriatric psych patients. So I like to be realistic. I think that realistically this won't happen. You really have to think about it in two groups. Again, are they cognitively declined or are they cognitively intact? If they're cognitively declined, they're going to be presenting with a family member or spouse or someone. You will have to coordinate with that person giving that person the instructions and everything to do, call them ahead of time, make sure that everything is in place, but likely you'd be dealing with that person, not the actual patient. Now, if somebody is uh, cognitively intact, all this needs to be coordinated ahead of time. But what I find particularly with the geriatric psych patients is that if you're trying to work with them, a lot of them are gonna have trouble with the telemedicine platform. Um, written instructions is better than verbal. They're all going to forget. So these are things and templates that should be happening like now, just like we have templates for our notes, we should have templates for this. But one of the things that I will say that I, that I did as a psychiatrist, because I don't actually have to technically touch a person, ideally I would like to see them, but honestly, for a lot of my geriatric patients, I, they just weren't getting it. So I, I made a drastic call to give them a telephone call and even cut out the face to face um, contact, which is not ideal, but it's better to have the overall appointment, give them what they need, even if that means for me, I can't actually see their face. So I substituted with the approval of my supervisor that I think could be done if you absolutely can't make it work. And this is not recommended, but in certain, again, this is like more emergency situations. Um, you might, might consider making a substitute of a telephone call or if they can't get the virtual FaceTime uh, I was about to say FaceTime. If they can't get the platform to work, you might consider calling them but having a FaceTime meeting, which is something that um, hopefully a person working with them will know how to operate. And here are just some references. I, that's it. <laughs>